Yep, I see it. Well, thank you very much, Pete. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure uh, to be visiting and working with you today uh, by Adobe Connect. And I want to thank Pete Flores, uh, who serves as our moderator. Uh, but note that along the way, if you do have a question, uh, please put it in the chat box. And while my brain is thinking about what I'm going to be saying and how to say it correctly, uh, Pete is going to be looking at the chat box. And, and throughout this period, if you have questions, uh, please put those in the chat box. And then we'll try to answer them along the way or in the final five or ten minutes at the end of this series. In 2019, as I was driving up and down the roads of Texas, one of the things that kept getting my attention was the large amount of vines that were growing on our fences. Having grown up in the San Angelo area, uh, a lot of the vines there also served as wildlife food and part of wildlife habitat, and, and especially uh, for a group of birds that I watched where I lived, uh, the finches and the sparrows, they were commonly using the mustang grape and the greenbriars that were along the fences as escape cover from the Harris hawk and a couple other hawks uh, that would be after them for lunch and supper. So these birds uh, commonly dove into the mass of vines that we see today and they would escape predation. So vines, sometimes we look at them like we do weeds or our unwanted uh, woody brush species and we ask what are they good for and if I have them should I be doing something about them? Well I put together uh, 14 Facebook posts about the vines that I was seeing and I included pictures that would aid in the identification of a vine because today uh, nine of the 14 vines that I wrote about last year are going to be included today and these 14 vines three of them were in the grape family uh, Two vines were in the legume family or the passion flower family, and then from the big noniaceae and the sumac and the lily and the buttercup family, the morning glory, um, the sapindaceae, and then the wonderful cucumber family, uh, I have one in each one of those. But other vines are, are still showing up, and as we travel around, we get to see these vines and going 79 and a half miles an hour down Highway 281, do you question who they are? What would you need to know to be able to identify that vine and then be able to access uh, additional information about the vine? So today, part of our effort is also to look at integrated pest management uh, the IPM approach of handling unwanted plants. What would we be doing? So I'm happy to be here. Now, here are the main five things that I'm going to try to cover in this uh, hour program. And number one, as you see on the screen, what are the characteristics of a vine? Why are vines a special group of plants that have special characteristics that allow them to climb on things? And then how do the vines grow on a fence? What are the common names of the vines and how do I identify them? And then from an integrated pest management standpoint, how can I suppress or control a vine? Are all vines considered to be pests? And these are the, the things that I'm gonna try to talk about. Well, looking at our ecological situation, in, in this case, with the title of the program, we're looking at fences. And typically, all the fences that we have in Texas have been built by humans who own or manage the land. So fencing from the 1880s to the present 
we've done it for two basic reasons. One is private property rights, and secondly, control when our rangeland is going to be rested from livestock grazing, or when is it going to be grazed by our livestock. The great fence is the one thing that gives us much control in our grazing management because we are able to rest land and graze land. So traditionally, fencing was used to keep something in or something out. And that's how I look at it at my yard and the property that I have. But in a biological system, for everything we do, like building a fence, there is a multitude of things that can happen. So I will go to the next slide and look at this image that is actually taken in Brazos County. And believe it or not, there is a, a five bobbed wire fence going through the middle of that brush line. There's all kinds of plants, including vines, that can occur and grow in this ecological situation. It's not always a vine. It could be a shrub. It could be a tree. It could be one of our 19 species of prickly pear cacti. So how do they do it? And what do they do it for? So actually in this image, you're looking at Chinese privet hedge, uh, the, the common or evergreen yopon, loblolly pine, mustang grape, passion flower, greenbrier, eastern red cedar, possum grape, Carolina snail seed, poison ivy, marine ivy, gumbumelia, honey locust, and cedar elm. Now, out of all those, can you see them? And so think about when I'm managing my land. If I look at a group of plants like this, most people are going to say, look at the brush. But in that term, brush, we will find that woody-based plants called vines also occur in that scenario. So think about the things that we deal with that come up on a fence. Here's a picture taken in Menard County. And here is a woody plant. Looks like a vine growing on this fence. But is it a vine? It is any is a vine is any kind of plant with a growing habit of trailing or scandent. And the word scandent implies that it is climbing by stems or runners. So this picture is taken of white honeysuckle, Lanicera albiflora, uh, a shrub with vine-like branches growing on the fence line. And note that these stems are straight. And they're growing straight up. So why aren't these branches already twisting and turning and locking itself down on the fence? Well, we're going to find out why we have a world of plants called vines. So a vine displays a growth form based on long stems. Any of the vines that I look at, they can have from one foot to 35 foot long stems. To have long stems has two purposes. First, a vine may use a rock exposure or, or other plants or other supports such as a fence for growth rather than investing energy in a lot of supportive tissue like trees do, enabling the plant to reach sunlight with a minimum investment of energy. So all these long stems have a certain amount of flexibility to them. They are not lignified and hardened as we see in our tree and shrub group. Most of our vines have phototropism, and what that interprets as is that they grow toward a source of light. And in this case, out on the ranger land, it is the sun. Secondly, the vine growth form is an adaptation to life in areas where small patches of fertile soil occur, but they are adjacent to exposed areas with more sunlight, but little or no soil 
or water holding capacity. So a vine can root in the available good soil, but have most of its leaves in the brighter exposed area where there is less soil and less water, getting the best of both environments. So often the vine growth form can enable plants to colonize large areas quickly. And some of these large areas may be devoid of other major uh, plant life. So none of the vines that we will discuss today are parasitic or semi-parasitic. Certain plants always grow as a vine, while a few grow as a vine only part of the time. And our number one example throughout most of Texas is poison ivy. If the poison ivy is growing at a, as a low shrub, then the support structure that it needs to grow on or lean on is not available. But if that support structure is available, then the poison ivy will become a vine and, and attach to that support and act like a vine. So sometimes the shrubby poison ivy is called poison oak and the vine is called poison ivy. But research reports show that genetically these two names, poison oak and poison ivy, are one in the same family and they are both uh, in the Anacardiaceae or the sumac family. When we look at other characteristics of vines, uh, climbing plants such as vines require an external support to grow vertically and enhance light acquisition. Vines that find a suitable support have greater performance and fitness, that's overall health of the plant, than those that remain prostrate or growing by laying on the ground. But most of these vines we'll look at today I can find them growing in areas that they don't have a support system to grow on. And I find them growing out on flat or rolling ground. Therefore, the location and finding of a suitable support structure is a key process in the life history of climbing plants. So why are vines growing on a fence? How did the propagules or seeds of a vine get exactly underneath the fence wire? Well, many scientists suggest that the building of a fence by humans turns out to be the supporting device for the success of vines because the fence structure serves as a physical roost or resting location for many species of birds who tend to defecate while they're sitting on the fence. And then there's those the defecation may have seeds that have not been broken or or destroyed in the digestive tract and those can ultimately make plants. Other scientists and observers have noted that the management of the land under a fence is markedly different than just a foot or two away from the fence's influence. So when I think about my grazing pastures, I think about my hay pastures, then why in those pastures do we have vines on the fence, but that area with the fence and underneath it and on both sides of the fence, it's not going to be uh, treated in the same manner always as is the open pasture. Plus the upper story of established woody shrubs and trees can modify the environment under a fence line, including the shading by those plants, making cooler temperatures at the soil level, and then reducing evaporation and having water available longer for seedlings. So here is our first question, Pete. And I want you to read this with us, and Pete has provided a box for you to respond, but I want you to mark true or false, as we study how vines grow, we find they need a physical structure to support their growth, such as a fence, rather than investing energy in a lot of supported tissue, enabling the plant to reach sunlight 
with a minimum investment of energy. Now, you should mark true or false. And we'll give you just a second as a uh, half of you have now voted. And my boss told me that if you don't get this question right, uh, I may not continue to have a job. But hopefully you get the point that I'm making by a follow-up question asking about what is behind how uh, these vines grow. And I've just noticed uh, maybe the boss is here. I just got an email from him, though. Pete, we've got uh, two-thirds of our participants have voted. Let's go ahead and close the poll there, and uh, we'll move on to the next item that I'd like to cover. The mechanisms by which vines or climbing plants ascend or grow on a fence. Think about this fact. Vines are always in competition for light. They start out from a seed on the ground, and they're either competing with grass, shrubs, or trees. And so the thing that a vine is trying to do is win the race to light. And so these mechanisms I've listed here are the things that the vine uses to be able to grow straight stems up and attach to something but get to the light. So one of the mechanisms is vines use tendrils with adhesive disc-shaped pads for attaching to a structure. As you've seen, some of our ornamental vines will grow straight up a fireplace wall or a rock wall. They're using adhesive disc-shaped pads on the end of the tendrils to attach to a rock or brick surface. Some of the vines have tendrils without adhesive pads, but they are like solitary or paired tendrils that will wrap around uh, a structure like a barbed wire fence. The third category is we have vines that are twiners or stems that twist and turn for wrapping around the support structure. And we even have vines that the petiole between the stem and to the leaf will actually bend and wrap around something, but we know that those kind of leaves and the twisting of that of that stem is due to the sun coming up in the east and setting in the west. A large number of our vines, they will wrap that petiole, and even our stem, uh, the twiners, will wrap in a counterclockwise direction. Scientists have shown that that actually is a characteristic of the plant and not really due to the sun. So some of our vines have adventitious roots. They arise from an organ other than the root. And so think about, you've noticed on a grass that at a node, that grass up in the air will send out a root structure. Well, that's an adventitious root. So it usually comes from a stem at a node, and sometimes the adventitious root can arise from the leaf. So, in, in looking at integrating in our knowledge management, we are giving uh, IPM uh, management credit today, and I want to define a few things and then relate this to the identification and further management of a vine. Integrated Pest Management, or IPM, is an effective and environmentally sensitive approach to pest management that relies on a combination of common sense practices. IPM programs use current, comprehensive information on the life cycles of pests 
and their interaction with the environment. This information in combination with available pest control methods is used to manage pest damage by the most economical means and with the least possible hazard to people, property, and the environment. So integrated pest management is generally targeted toward controlling pests inside your home, in the garden, on the lawnscape, out in a park, on our school grounds, on our ranches, and our natural areas. But who are the pests? Your neighbors? Insects? Birds? Diseases? Viruses? Fungi? White-tailed deer that sneak into the yard at night and eat your rose bushes? weeds and brush and in this number six group with our woody plants we have our vines included in this group so in IPM there's a non-chemical pest control techniques that are being looked at integrated pest management is an approach to pest management that employs multiple tactics to prevent pest problems uh, number two suppress pop pest populations, look at that word suppress, that word prevent, and number three, minimize the use of pesticides. I think in our society, everyone dreams that they can go to the ag store or Lowe's or Home Depot, and there's a one liter amber jar there for $7 that contains some kind of chemical that I can go home and spray and solve all my problems of my landscape. But it's just not true. So what are the recognized tactics or tools without chemicals like herbicides when considering vines of fences? And I think when we go back in, in time, at the beginning in the 1880, vines are recognized in the literature uh, on early fences before 1900. But other than herbicides, we have mechanical methods. We have prescribed burning. But how about the biology of the pest? Finding a weakness and how the pest grows. Things you already have access to, and, and, and these are important, your own mind, and using common sense that we've been trained to employ. So, management. Best management practices. In 1973, Drucker described management as the art and science of making the correct decision. He said the tools of management, including seeding, unwanted plant control, prescribed burning, control of livestock numbers, time of grazing, plow it up and reseed, build fences. Those are not management but those items are the tools of management that we pick from. But commonly, we leave out the axe, we leave out the shovel, we leave out the strength of our own arms and back for getting rid of something. So, brush and weed control practices include chemical, mechanical, biological, and fire. And so, do all people need the same practices? Do all properties have the same history, the past uses, and the same problems? Practices help solve problems, but what caused the problem to begin with? Drucker is signifying what we've been teaching for, uh, in management for 60 years. Management is selecting the right things to do. So out of the bailiwick of tools, which one will you pick? So let's investigate these nine vines today and look at this first image in the top left corner is the image of the vine growing on a fence. And here it is growing on a seven foot uh, wildlife management fence. And the name of this plant that we're looking at is Drummond clematis but it's also called Texas Virgin's Bower, Barbus de Shabato, Graybeard, Granddad Beard, Love in the Mist, Goat Beard, and Herba de los Averos. So all plants in Texas and all the vines that we're looking to at today are native to the state. Well, these names have come about 
because many of these vines, like old Mansbeard, they grow in many parts of the state. And so settlers and early people who saw them gave them a name. And so we try to use the most accepted name in our literature, but to communicate locally, you need to know the name that that plant is called in your local area to be able to visit with people who have knowledge about the plant. So the old man's beard, it's native. It's a warm season perennial deciduous vine that occurs naturally in all vegetation areas except East Texas and the Piney Woods. Old man's beard is a member of the Ranunculaceae or the Crowfoot family and has the scientific name Clematis dramundii. In the bottom right picture, notice that the petiole and the stem the newest stems of this stem that's going up to get to light, these are the items that wrap around a structure. The petiole uh, subtending the leaf and then the stem that the petiole and leaf is attached to. So they have a wrapping action. Well within the old man's beard, we, the top left picture is the male flower of the old man's beard and it has up to 35 stamen in it uh, and it doesn't produce the long feathery filaments that I see in the bottom right which are the female flowers that we're seeing right now throughout central and south Texas that the old man's beard is in flower. So the leaves of the plant are pinnately compound and have three to seven foliate uh, leaflets and the leaf petioles are long and slender and twisting to assist the plant in climbing. So the female flowers are the ones that show up in all the wildflower books and that we see photographers take. But look at that top flower. This flower does not have any ray flowers. Uh, these are all more like in the sunflower family, central or disc flowers. So look at the twining by that stem or the pet leaf petiole. And so it's twisting. And notice here that this, this, in this example, it's wrapping around the, the wire uh, of a fence in a clockwise direction. So here again, another example. And, and, and in, in this one, it's going to be wrapping in a clockwise direction as well, but you can see uh, a better close-up of the leaves and how they are lobed uh, and divided in their structure. Hard to see at uh, 79 and a half miles an hour. This next uh, vine is the Sharp Pod Morning Glory. It's native. It's a warm season perennial. It has twining and low climbing uh, stems. That, and it occurs naturally in all Texas vegetation areas except the high plains and the Trans-Pecos. Of course, we might ultimately find it in both of those areas. But it occurs in fields, pastures, thickets, woodlands, stream bottoms, fence rows, backyards, parks, roadsides, and other disturbed areas. So it's classified as a disturbance plant, as are many of our annual weeds. So the sharp pod morning glory is a member of the convolvulaceae or the morning glory family and has the scientific name Ipomea uh, cordatotriloba or however you want to say that. So other names for this same plant that I'll find in the literature include wild morning glory, purple flowering morning glory, the Thai vine, and coastal morning glory. Again, relative to the zone where somebody saw it and named it. But look down in the picture. The, this morning glory, it uses its stems to twist and turn and go in and out of this chain link fence, climbing up it. So the vine can be found climbing to five meters or more in length on fences. The vine stems are green to purple red and they are pubescent. And you can see in this image that a lot of the stem material here is tinted red. So when I look at the flower, 
up in the top right it is a funnel shaped flower and then in the top left I'm looking down into the flower that flower is about two inches wide it can be rosy lavender it can be purple rose uh, it has variations but still the same plant and notice even in that top left picture I'm looking at reddish tinted stems down in the bottom right I'm looking at the seed capsules that come after the flowers are gone but the ovary was pollinated and I've produced seeds and and in that capsule there will be one to four seed located there in our third vine this is going to be the only annual vine that we're going to discuss. The rest of the vines today are going to be perennials. But this vine growing down in Washington County is called Common Balloon Vine. It's a native. It's warm season. It comes up in the spring, grows all summer, and then dies in the fall. Uh, but it is an annual sprawling and trailing vine that climbs with axillary tendrils. And if I look at the picture to the right, I can see how the axillary tendrils that come out between where the leaves and the stem are, and those tendrils, which can be branched, they are wrapping around this barbed wire fence. And the literature shows that they can, they're not as, get as long as stems as the morning glory, but up to two meters or more in length on fences. And if I look at this next one, here is a plant in the top left that appears to have a compound leaf, except that it is a divided leaf. It's twice compound, and it's set out there in threes. And, and the leaflets are tooth and lobed, and this plant is uh, on the common balloon vine. It is not in the legume family. Uh, but in a separate family, uh, I wonder what the name of the family is. Let me go back, and I had it on the previous slide. Uh, it is in the Sapindaceae, or the Soapberry family, uh, the same family that our Western Soapberry occurs in. So look at the bottom right picture, and I can look at the inflated fruit, uh, and it looks and holds air like a balloon. And I'm using my arrow here to kind of show you where the balloon is. But notice the flowers of this plant are very small and white. But inside the fruit, it is a three-celled fruit. And it can have uh, one seed in each one of those uh, chambers of that fruit. And inside, there is a membrane that helps hold the air in there. So you can actually take that fruit and pop the air out of it with your hand. Now, the only plant that has ever been out of this group that's ever been on a noxious or invasive plant list in the state of Texas is this common balloon vine. So look at the flowers, very small. But look at the tendrils, the axillary tendrils in the picture that are used up here for climbing and attaching to a structure. If I go to my next image, this is a vine that's noticed that the stem down here uh, at coming up from the bottom where I've got the era and then coming out the top that it's wrapping in a counterclockwise way around this cedar elm. But this plant is green milk vine or Metalia reticulata that also has several other names that are used in central Texas. And this is the one plant that we're looking at today that is a member of the milkweed family. If I break the stem, I break the leaf petiole, uh, I break the leaf open, I'm going to find a white milk. It is a true member of the milkweed family. And this is what the fruit of this plant looks like. Uh, it is called a follicle. And the follicle uh, has sharp pointed wart-like structures called tubercles that occur on this viney milkweed. 
The next plant is uh, common in central Texas and growing along railroad tracks as I was growing up. Uh, but this plant is called buffalo gourd most commonly, and it is a warm season perennial. Uh, and it has leaves that are very leathery. leathery. Uh, and if you crush the leaves or crush the stem or even the fruit that we'll see here in the next image, uh, that fruit will, will have a stinking odor to it and sometimes it's called stinking gourd. But the leaves down here in the bottom left, they can be up to 12 inches long and they're covered with a very fine hair that allows water to roll off of the leaf. The flower of the uh, gourd plant is a yellow flower with yellow uh, petals built into it and it can trail along and get up to greater than 15 feet. The next plant that we're looking at is called Ivy Tree Vine, and this is actually a picture on a fence where I'm growing donkeys in the past, but it's a native warm season perennial. Uh, it occurs in all areas of Texas except the high plains, and it is a member of the grape family. Three of the vines today are in the grape family, but it's also called cow itch, marine vine, uh, marine ivy, and herba del bue, and the vine climbs uh, using tendrils. And in this next picture, here is a, a, a good picture of the tendril, and it's a single tendril. It's not paired as we saw back in the balloon vine. And so it attaches to the bob wire, it wraps around that bob wire, and then gives the vine ability to grow towards sunlight. Here in this picture, uh, we're looking at pepper vine, but notice in the fence that the canes of the vine are there from last year. And that on this pepper vine, what we see a lot of times is that the, the vine stems die back to the ground and in the next year all new growth must come from the buds in the crown of the plant. And uh, look down in the bottom right, again it looks like it has a compound uh, type leaf but it's a bipinnately compound leaf. So the legume family is not the only family with a compound leaf but this can have from 9 to 34 leaflets per leaf. And as I look at the flowers, they're greenish and whitish, uh, and they occur in a chymose cluster. And when these flowers turn to fruit, and I'm looking at the young fruit where I have the arrow right now, young fruit forming in those flowers, uh, it's going to turn black, uh, and it becomes a berry that a lot of uh, birds and, and many of our varmints will eat. So... The probably most common uh, fence vine that I see in the state of Texas is right here, the saw greenbrier. And the word saw reflects out of 11 species in the genus Smilax that this one has barbs or cat claw like thorns on the stem. And if you grab it to pull it out of the ground, if you don't have gloves up, gloves on you're going to cut yourself up but look at the other names down here in the bottom uh, left catbriar bullbriar zarza priya tramps trouble and china briar the growth form of this plant is a straggling to climbing vine uh, and look at the leaves the leaves when they're young and tender and they were pink to orange to purplish red, they were not lignified, and early settlers were noted to have eaten the leaves of the greenbrier at the same level that we eat lettuce today. So some of these plants are valued as wildlife food. And if I look at the greenbrier fruit here in the top left, it's green, but as it matures, it's going to turn black. And again, there are many varmints and species of birds uh, that will eat those berries. But these leaves, in some situations, 
are a favorite food for even white-tailed deer. And so they will munch on the new stems and the new leaves that are there. So vines, look at the twisting and turning of this stem and its branches. It's trying to find something to attach to to get to light. And this is a characteristic of our vines. So in question number two, Pete, if you'll, if you'll put that question box up, true or false, all of the vines that are pests on our fences are members of the Vitaceae or grape family. Is that true or false? And we were looking at nine different families here in the program today. So we'll just take 15 more seconds and then we'll advance on. That's a good representation, Pete. Let's go ahead and, and close out the question. Now, let's think about common sense and, and non-herbicide management tools. Because the animals that we run on the land, our cattle, our sheep, the goats, the native animals that were here, the bison, the white-tailed deer, the mule deer, and then our imported horses, pronghorn antelope and elk, could I manage grazing and browsing animals to have an impact on these vines that we have on our fence? I think if this was a large effort that could be conducted, we wouldn't have the number of vines on the fences that I see today. But the sheep and goat numbers uh, are lower than they used to be, and so the impact is I'm going to look at the diet of a cow. It is predominantly grass. Uh, the, the sheep eat some browse. The goats eat quite a bit of browse, depending upon what species of goat I'm looking at. The bison were mainly grass eaters. The white-tailed deer eat a lot of browse, especially when their favorite food, the forb category, or our weeds, are not there. The mule deer, they're browsing animals that uh, out in the Trans-Pecos and up into New Mexico and the Panhandle of Texas, they're browsers, but they eat some grass and some forbs. Horses predominantly eat grass. Uh, the pronghorn antelope are both grass eaters, forb eaters, and browse eaters, but they're out there on the rangeland. And then look at elk. Elk are mainly grass consumers. So what could I do with that? And so when I see an animal eating a vine on one ranch, that may not reflect how much of that vine it would eat in a different location because all of that diet preference is going to depend on what is available to that grazing animal. So look in this picture and, and using biological control with goats, the pasture on the left of this fence was grazed with one goat per acre for 90 days from the beginning of March to the beginning uh, to the ending of May. And notice that the dominant weed in this pasture is common broom weed, and it has ragweed, and it has uh, snow on the prairie. And then over here on the right side, Notice that this was grazed by, at the same period of time, for 90 days, with three goats to the acre. But what is apparent is that goats are browsers first, and the goats have built a browse line all the way across the back of this fence. But notice that they did eat the forbs, and that more grass, and my number one forb on this side is prairie tea, or one seed croton. So, the animals can have an impact. So here on Highway 21, look at all this green briar, and could I manage these cows? Are these cows eating the green briar? Can I use them as a tool 
to suppress or manage Greenbrier. Well, let's look at how much is really there, and this whole corner and most of this pasture has Greenbrier growing on it. But from your opinion, are the cows suppressing it? And so when I look, I, I can build myself a viewpoint by this pasture being on the highway. The top left pasture is looking at the amount of Greenbrier in an ungrazed situation on the Blackland Prairie. This is uh, actually probably previously farmland, but the Greenbrier is on the Highway 21 side. And does it look any different than the bottom right picture when I'm looking inside the fence where the livestock are? And what would you say? Are the cattle effective managers of that Greenbrier? And, and I can use them as a suppression tool because more than likely they're not going to be killing any of the Greenbrier because in this picture, look at this Greenbrier down at the base of it. It has been mowed several times and the new growth stems of the Greenbrier are growing straight up to get to sunlight. But this plant has the ability to sprout from the ground whether it has been burned, it has been mowed, or you went out there and chopped it, or an animal ate it to the soil surface, the greenbrier is going to come back from buds that are in the crown and at the top of a corm uh, that's underground that has a bud zone all around it. So, an important characteristic of vines to be thought about as I make a decision on a suppression or control tool that some vines are annuals. The example here is the balloon vine. So when I look at that greenbrier, one of our uh, recommendations in our guidelines for brush and weed control is a dormant stem treatment because the stems of the greenbrier are perennial stems. They're not going to die back to the ground each year, and I can spray those stems when the leaves get out of the way. But the majority of our vines are perennials. So things like a stem treatment with a chemical would be valuable. But secondly, within these perennials, some of the vines are like half shrubs. The above ground growth dies each winter, and in the spring, new growth emerges from the crown. So if I sprayed the stems of these plants in the winter, I would be spraying dead tissue, wasting my time and wasting my money. And the examples here, the sharp, sharp pod, morning glory, viney milkweeds, Carolina snail seed, and marine ivy. They all, their stems all die back to the ground. But some of the vines grow by producing perennial stems and continue to grow year after year, with the example being mustang grape, poison ivy, old man's beard, and greenbrier. So this knowledge about a vine you would have to be able to name it or experience it out in the field to be able to make that determination and a correct management decision. So as I look, here are here is old man's beard that has been sprayed on the fence. Whatever this person sprayed, it defoliated the plant. It killed the leaves and they fell off. Is the plant dead? just because the leaves died. Well, if the chemical is not effective as a stem treatment, then those stems are probably going to be alive. And looking into the spring, what I saw on this plant is look at all the growth here at the bottom coming up through the plant and already climbing up to the fence. And this is what it looked like on the 1st of May. And so the crown was not dead, but when I got into those stems, look what I found. The stems that looked like they had died were actually putting out leaves and the plant was coming back. So whatever the rancher sprayed, it served as a suppression tool, but it led the, left the dead growth in the fence and then that growth started to come back the following year. In Menard County, look at this vine growing on uh, a sheep type or goat type wire fence. And uh, if I get close to it, I can name it. And it turns out to be the, the spread lobe uh, passion flower. But look at the size of its stem. A very small, 
no bigger than the pencil lead in an elementary school uh, pencil, but it also has tendrils for wrapping. So what would I think about controlling that plant? Well, I got down on the ground, I dug through all the grass and the vines that were down there, and I cut the vine off. Is the plant dead? And, gen and remember, this is not an annual. This is a perennial, so the plant is going to come back. But if I use the sponge on the end of a stick and I treated the 12 inches of that stem that I left there, I probably could wipe on Remedy Ultra in diesel or methylated seed oil, and I might be able to control that plant, but we do not have that data. No one has actually done that on this plant. So the plant here is growing up the wire, and in the next year, it came back after being clipped. So I'm looking at greenbrier stems, and along the fence line, greenbrier stems are usually easier to find. And so I go in there and I use a hand cutter. I use my pruners and I cut that stem. And so, and how much of that stem should I leave when I recognize, and James Jackson, our program specialist at, at Stephenville, provided me with the pictures of the underground corm of a greenbrier plant. And notice the knots that it has. It even has sharp points on it. But look at the stems that are coming out of that underground corm. And so it's a pretty big stem producer. And uh, if I cut them off, the plant doesn't die. But like with this uh, stem of a Mustang grape, if I go in there and find it, I could cut them and I could treat them. But I want my chemical to be done in the winter time when the stems uh, have lost their leaves and some of the growth has settled down to the ground. And this is still a picture under a fence. And here I am cutting the stem of this Mustang grape. And so it left a bigger end as big uh, up to the size of an elementary school pencil. But I'm leaving enough tissue to treat if I pick a stem treatment. So, true or false, the following plant parts can all be used to aid a vine in climbing and attaching to a physical support. The stems, the leaves, the tendrils, and adventitious roots. Is that statement true or false? Okay, Pete, we've got up to our 41 that we had last time. But the answer to this question, like the previous questions, is true. All of these plant parts can serve in one way or another to help the plant climb. So here is the Mustang grape, and its stems are twisting and turning, but it also, if you look over here in the top left, it has a single... Uh, tendril that comes out for wrapping. So look at this individual between Quero and Yoakum, and he went out back in late March and he treated this fence line uh, with a soil sterilant or a herbicide to knock the grass back, make it look nice, and maybe have suppression on the vines that were growing there. So how successful is that? We'll determine that this summer. But on the other side of the gate, he also sprayed the Mustang grape. And, and notice in this plant, here is the stump of the Mustang grape right here. And he's already trimmed on it. I counted 14 cut stems. And so this plant is a perennial, keeps coming back. And look at all the growth that the current stems have. He defoliated the plant. He got rid of the leaves, but is it dead? And so when I go back and look at it, I can find green leaves coming out on the stems. But he used the herbicide as a suppression tool, just like I would do with hand cutting or, or, or chopping or sawing a plant down. 
But the thing he didn't realize is look at the ground surface under the fence. The vine here is viney milkweed. And when he got rid of the leaves and the shading impact of the fence right up here that you see at the top of the picture, he opened it up for other vines to come up, including the sharp pod morning glory. And as I see in this picture, uh, here's the sharp pod morning glory that's coming up besides that viney milkweed that's coming back. So sometimes I do things that generate my next problem. So can the fire be used as a tool in our IPM program? And what we're going to justify is that the fire does do things on the land, releasing seeds, stimulates germination, stimulates flowering and fruiting, alters seed beds, stimulates vegetative reproduction and sprouting, eliminates or reduces competition for surviving species for a moment in time, and then it creates a mosaic of different ages and structure out there on the land. But if I look at where a wildfire went through this fence on Highway 281 at, at Encino, and this burned in late March, and I took this picture on a trip back to College Station in June, and look at how much the guinea grass has grown. The guinea grass was actually up to six foot tall, but is that the only impact, the release of grass? When I got down on the ground, I found that the sharp pod morning glory had been burned to the ground and because this had been a totally blacked out wildfire, but the sharp pod morning glory was already coming back. Will it be the winter? Will it cover the fence? Or will another vine also be promoted and it will compete with the grass? So ladies and gentlemen, we do have a, a one vine recommendation in our ERM 1466 uh, guidelines for brush and weed control on rangeland. And it is the Greenbrier. And in this case, for a Greenbrier, it is a stem treatment. And it doesn't mean you have to cut the vine, the vines off, but you can treat the stems with Remedy Ultra and Diesel at 25% Remedy Ultra, 75% diesel or methylated seed oil when you can spray the stems. And the reason that one of these methods is recommended for the dormant season is in the dormant season, a lot of the greenbrier leaves fall to the ground, opening up a view to the stems. So in, in our ERM 1466, this is one of the, I mean, in our Brush Busters program, this is the easy to use and high amount of death of stems type characteristic. And so my method of putting it out is going to determine my success because I'm going to be treating 12 to 18 inches of the stem. And notice on my meter stick here, I'm marking 12 inches, so that's how high up I've got to go spray. But when I go to spray, I spray from the base of the stem up to the 12 inches or more. I don't start at the top, or what I'm spraying starts rolling over itself and puddling at the ground level. I'm trying to get the herbicide through the stem and not through the soil. So, in, in step three, uh, I'm looking at that equipment, and this is in our Brush Busters brochure, and I'm going to be using a small orifice nozzle, an X1 uh, cone nozzle, so that I can get uh, a finer spray to cover the stems. I'm going to spray until they're wet, uh, but controlling Greenbrier is not a one-time job, and retreatment may be necessary, and usually is. So if I look... In ERM 1466, we also have two recommendations listed in there, but they're both with triclopyr ester or the triclopyr, um, uh, the other formulation of the triclopyr. And so here, uh, it's also recommending the use of a dye or and use of a penetrant like Sidekick so that I can get good penetration of the stems. But this is in a recommendation where I have many other plants included 
where I'm using this triclopyr ester. But both of those items are available online or be available uh, in our beef cattle short course uh, proceedings for in August. So what do other people look at? If we only have one recommendation, two, three recommendations for one vine, what are other people doing to control vines? As I visited with county agents and members of our chemical company population, I found out that some people are trying surmount as a foliar spray. They are indicating that they are getting a certain level of perceived control. Others are looking at combinations. The Esplond EZ and the Cimarron Plus is a foliar spray. Uh, the Pasture Guard and the Cimarron Plus. If I try the Surmount, uh, that is a restricted herbicide and I'm going to have to have a license. But these two formulations with the Cimarron Max, they are not restricted and you don't have to have a license. And a couple of people, uh, like Pete, our moderator, he is trying and working with one of our range specialists even on a three-way mix for vine treatment pre-bloom. And so uh, in part of that research that is going on down here in South Texas, Mesaview, one of our newest chemicals on the market, is being looked at as an IPT on fence lines for old man's beard control. But the results are not there. But look at the fence line here in this picture. Uh, and Pete, would you like to say something about what you did right there? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, basically, uh, what I did on this particular fence line is I used uh, Mesaview uh, 1% uh, with 0.28% with surfactant and just IPT'd it. With my with my sprayer, when my sprayer it's a, it's a ATV which I can keep like 20 pounds of pressure whenever I'm spraying. But but the thing that Pete's going to tell you is this is a 2019 treatment, and generally even for vines like we do our woody plants, our trees and shrubs, we're going to wait for two years out to determine what the amount of control of this plant was. Undoubtedly. He's killed the above ground stems and, and the chemical that he used can be thought of as a suppression tool. But until I dig down in here and I look for new growth from the crown and off of remaining stems, will I know the level of control that's there? Thank you, Pete. And so what have we discovered? That the majority of our non-chemical or herbicide methods provide for top kill and plant suppression but do not provide root kill unless the top of the plant is continually removed until the root system runs out of energy and nutrients to drive new shoot development. And these include our animal herbivory, top removal by hand cutting or mowing and fire, but all can be excellent choices for suppression. The fences we have built as humans for one reason or another, serve as excellent physical support for vines to grow on, and you, the vine use that support to get to light. Number three, we currently do not have a foliar or leaf spray chemical and the methodology for the control of any vine root system. But the search is on for finding a herbicide that will provide root kill. So there's what our future looks like. And ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate you being here today and, and joining us for this webinar. Uh, I hope you got some information and that is valuable to you related to the five goals that I set in with this talk. And so uh, notice in the chat box uh, that Kelly would like Pete for you to send the treatment recommendation by email. Our Brush Busters brochure and what we have in REM 1466. And so Vance, we thank you for your comment uh, about our discussion on Greenbrier. It is definitely one that we 
we continue to work on year after year uh, but I also have to look at it from uh, the predator solution with wildlife. I look at it that it's not a poisonous plant that humans actually ate the leaves and young stems. And I have to look at it as that some of the wildlife will eat the stems and leaves when they are young. So would anybody yes, else have a question? Uh, Pete? What, Dr. What do you uh, Dr. Uh, Rector, uh, Kelly asked if there's a permanent cure for the common uh, balloon? Do you know, I do not, and I have not seen a single recommendation for controlling it. But as an annual plant, I would suspect that when it's young, that any of our most common weed control herbicides could be used to not just set it back, but you might kill it when it is younger with a foliar broadcast or an IPT broadcast type treatment. I think like many of our plants, when it gets up the flower and, and gets that six foot of stems up there, it's going to be much harder to control. Yes, as the, as the questions come in, let me go ahead and uh, kick this out right quick. Say that our next session is going to be August the 6th. Uh, Dr. Tim Steffen is going to be talking to us about wildlife preparations, effects and recovery. And again, as we mentioned earlier today, uh, if you follow us on Facebook, facebook.com slash TXRange, uh, we'll have uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Rector and, and Dr. Clayton have put some put good information up there on vines. I think like four, a series of 14, uh, 12 or 14 different articles. Yeah, there are vines up there right now, and I'm ready to release two more here in the coming two weeks. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to be an excellent place to find this kind of information out about the vines. And, and Pete, I might just mention that I'm, I'm doing a series titled "What on Rangeland, What Thistle Is This That I'm Seeing? And so across the 66 species of plants in Texas that have the common name thistle attached to their name, uh, I'm doing a series on those that we have seen this year and, and eight thistles are on the Facebook as posts right now with more to come. I'm going to go ahead and kick out a, a survey. Please answer the survey. All the answers are anonymous, so we appreciate y'all filling, filling that out. And while I kick it out, uh, Dr. Lyon, I mean, Dr. Rector, there's another question come in from Thomas. Yeah. And, and what did it say, Pete? It says, I've been using Remedy uh, C with diesel mix and pierce to stop the Greenbrier. Or is a yes. comment. As a and uh, hopefully he's not spraying it on the leaves, but he's getting it on those stems when the stems are available to be sprayed. Your we're, our our work in research shows that we're not benefited in the level of control by spraying the leaves. So that that remedy ultra with the diesel and the methylated seed oil, that is uh, basically just a basal stem or stem treatment. And again, let me go ahead and mention that if you paid or see you credit for the webinar, please type in your email address in the chat pod. And with that, uh, we'll wait for any more questions for Dr. Richter. Uh, hey, Pete, we're running out of age groups for me to check down here in the age category. You know, you know, and, and uh, I just throw this in, you know, I've, I've been fortunate been with extension for a while yep. and I got to work with fellows like you and Dr. Rector, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Tommy, Tommy Welch, Tom, mm -hmm. Tommy Welch uh, to J.F. Cadenhead, uh, Dr. Lyons, Larry White, Dr. Hansaka, Dr. Clayton, and of course the new the new folks. So, and uh, we we don't leave out our landowners that we've learned so much from.